Good evening. Since there are many guests from outside the school, I should introduce myself. I am Rodolfo Machado, co-chair of the Urban Planning and Design Department. And it is my, my honor and my pleasure to introduce uh, tonight the awarding of, of the, the ninth uh, Veronica uh, Raj Green Prize in Urban Design. Uh, we are very uh, thankful uh, to the Von Klem family for their support along the years. Uh, members of the family are here with us tonight. I believe it's the first visit to the school in quite some time. We're very honored to have you. I'm very thankful for your support. And the same, of course, to the, uh, to the um, Von Klem Foundation, uh, Michael and Luisa Von Klem Foundation, to be precise. The prize, as you, as you know, was uh, formed about 20 years ago at the school during the deanship of Professor Emeritus Gerald McHugh. Uh, it is a very interesting prize in urban design, perhaps one of the few, because it is only for built projects, not for designs, but for built projects and built during the last, uh, the last uh, 10 years. Uh, it, has a, it, is, it, it is very much international in scope, and, uh, and in the past, We've been lucky to find excellent projects in Asia, in South America, and many in Europe. But this is the first time that uh, an award is given to a project built in North America. Uh, very happy about that. I think it was time. Uh, of course, at the same time, you may, are, you may speculate about why this so, why does it take so long. And, uh, and you may speculate about the quality of urban design in the rest of the world or in this country and the why is for that, but I will not do that, so I just leave it as a question. Uh, the good thing is that this prize allows the school to recognize exemplary work and in a way influence the practice of urban design, if I may be so presumptuous, by legitimizing, in fact, diffusing, even sanctifying good work and, make, and that is exemplary work, and, uh, and to really, uh, uh, in a way, you know, voice our support uh, for, for that kind of, of design. Um, <clears throat> the recipient of the 2007 uh, prize, as, as you know, these are no news, is the Seattle Art Museum Olympic Sculpture, Sculpture Park, designed by the New York-based firm of uh, Wiseman Freddy, which are here tonight, uh, we are tonight to receive the award. Uh, a number of acknowledgements are in order, and I should go through those. Uh, first, I would like to thank my colleague, Professor Busquets, for his skill uh, um, stewardship of the, of the, of the committee. Uh, it's a committee of four members. Uh, Professor Andrea Liars was uh, serving this year, together with uh, Professor Richard Sommer, and a guest, uh, a guest juror, uh, Mirko Sardini, the director of the Canadian Centre for Architecture based in Montreal who is here with us tonight, too. Uh, the group was assisted by James Kurz, uh, thanks to him, too, for a very useful uh, labor organizing the material that was submitted. I should tell you something about the process that is followed. About 80 projects were nominated by a large group of nominators from all over the world. That includes academicians, journalists, historians, practitioners uh, in urban design or in planning. Uh, after deliberations, a short list of two projects was achieved, uh, a project in Portugal and a project in Seattle. Uh, both were visited, and uh, those visits also meant uh, <coughs> meetings with the authorities or the, the, those involved in the construction of the projects. And after that, uh, by, by unanimous decision, the uh, prize was awarded to the Olympian, to this project in Seattle.
Uh, about the park, <coughs> much has been written about it because it became instantly uh, popular and successful. Uh, Acolytes have been sung, great deal of praise, uh, many, many good things and many, many publications, important ones in New York Times and other um, World Trade Journal and of the of that kind. To that series of publications, we are adding one more because we also produce this that I'm glad to say it's on time, rarely the rare honor to have it ready, fresh from the press at the night of the event. When I was in charge of this, it took about three or four months after, I have to confess. So congratulations for being so timely. Uh, the book, uh, uh, which you could acquire as a discounted price in the lobby, in the way out, uh, contains a number of essays by, uh, by colleagues, uh, members of the jury, and it's in fact, I think, quite, quite useful in its uh, uh, presentation of the project itself. Uh, it's been said, and we know that the design of the park is based in, 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 in a number of ideas that have been around in the culture of planning and design for years, but the great virtue is that it has realized those ideas. It has demonstrated that those ideas were useful and applicable and that have produced an exemplary project in my opinion. Uh, the ideas are, are known for years. We have been talking about the architectural appropriation of the design of the of public infrastructure, for instance, the, uh, the porosity of the ground plane and the continuity of the pedestrian net and the simultaneous use in one project of design techniques originally belonging to different disciplines. Or in other words, the park in this case is a work of architecture, is a work of landscape, is a work of urban design, is certainly a work of planning because to achieve the realization of this kind of project planning is of course fundamental. You, you may say that it occurs at the intersection of those disciplines and this is new, or you may say that it's not an intersection but it's a stratification of those knowledges of which used to belong to different disciplines please, the boundaries are erased and all that together then produces, uh, produces this exemplary project. Uh, so it's typical in a way of the history of urban design, the ideas first, ideas crystallize in project, project becomes exemplary, uh, becomes a type uh, because it can be reproduced and used for similar conditions and sometimes when it falls in bad designers' hands, it may also produce bad projects and then, it, and then that uh, gives birth to other new ideas. It's cyclical in a way, uh, what happens in between ideas and realizations. Um, the, um, it is difficult for me to add uh, fresh insights to this corpus of uh, praise and, and commentary that has been produced simply because I regret to say I have never been there. I, I know Seattle, but that was from time ago. I have not seen the park. So uh, not having a personal direct experience of the place, it's, it's almost risky to comment on, on things beyond what I have been, I've been reading and what I've been said. Now, I've been looking at a lot of photography of the place. And look at the photography, uh, and of course one admires the, the geometric attraction, the rigor, the, the, the clarity of the concept. Um, but it, it just occurred to me that the park uh, is a fantastic setting for fiction in a way. There is one of those places where there is a uh, begging for a movie to be made or pictures to be taken or fiction to be written that happens in those stages of sorts. Uh, getting a little bit uh, <laughs> out of control, uh, I, it made me think of an American Marienbad, Marienbad, the French Rococo Gardens, Baroque Gardens, in fact, no Rococo, uh, because of geometry, because of the green plains, because of the lack of the third dimension, in a way there are no walls, because of the sculpture and the rigor and the clarity. So I made that, that connection, and uh, uh, which uh, in, immediately uh, puts then, going back to the way in which those gardens have been used by movies, famous movies, uh, made me uh, somehow realize that, that this is so because the project has this uh, unique strength. It's formally very clear, it's very powerful, uh, it has an aura, I would say. It's hard to speak about ineffable things, but it has an aura, it has a presence, and, uh, and it's certainly uh, a project that begs some questions in that sense. Is this so because it is authored by a singly creative mind? I'm, so I'm putting both of you as a single creative mind. I'm used to do that. Um, 
is it is it is it is it is it because in fact uh, it's very different? It is a, no, you know, it's a project that has been mostly privately financed, funded, and uh, strangely, then is the uh, the project of of of, of, an, of an author in a way. Uh, it's exactly the opposite of what happens in Boston, where the public is the, the funding is, is is all public, and there is rarely one person by a team of many. And uh, I would like to pose then this question, this, this, this sort of risky connection in between then private funding of public places and single authorship on the one hand, multiple authors and multiple public monies on the other, and what happens to quality. And I will leave it at that, but I think it's, an, it's a question that, that is nice to pose. Uh, the project, of course, it is iconic. I mean, I, it's a word that has been seriously abused in recent times. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it proof of its iconicity is the fact that when this, this, you know, when you make, a, you know, there, there you have it. It's the Z, it's the sorrow, uh, it, it's some, <laughs> it's many things. And uh, so perhaps its, it's, it's, it's strength also comes from this synthesis in a way. Um, uh, I should say a few things about the architects, uh, even though by now they are very well known. It's a very, it's, they are professionally young, yet, yet they have achieved uh, many things already. Uh, there are uh, projects um, uh, under construction right now or about to become in the University of Virginia, I guess the arts, the arts complex in Virginia is it's certainly there, in Brooklyn, the Botanic and Garden, and, uh, and they also have an, another Olympic or Olympia Fields Park in, in, in Illinois. They seem to have the control of the Olympic things. Uh, <laughs> Uh, who knows, after doing those Olympic work, to, to which kind of Olympia will you, will you have access to? And uh, the, the House of the Gods is worth in you in architecture. Uh, they have received all the awards that one can receive, starting with the AIA um, gold medal and the emerging firms years ago when they were emerging. And then more importantly, in 2004, the, Academy, the American Academy of Arts and Letters gave the award in architecture, which I think is a, it's a, very, it's a very good one. A few words about themselves. Uh, Marion Wise uh, did undergraduate work at the University of Virginia and then at Yale, where she studied with James Sterling, I believe, and is now a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Michael Manfredi at, attended Notre Dame and then Cornell, uh, where he was a student of Colin Rowe. So there are some very, very, very neat pedigree going on there in both cases. Uh, there are two books on their work. Well, one already published, uh, uh, Site Specific is the title, The Work of Wise Manfredi Architects, and a second book about their work is coming up, Surface Dash Subsurface, uh, which will be published in 2008. Uh, I am very happy about this award. I think it's, it's pretty wonderful, and uh, I'm looking forward to their words. Uh, and after that, Professor Busquet then will, uh, will present the award to Weisman Freddy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Machado. I think we know your work for many, many years, and so I think it's uh, especially fitting that you gave a nice uh, and very generous introduction. Um, we would like to thank the Michael and Louisa von Klemm Foundation and Harvard University for recognizing the Olympic Sculpture Park. Increasingly, we designers are operating in a global environment, a global public realm that is becoming heavily privatized, all too often specialized in use, and given over almost exclusively to short-term effects. As the amount of public space, public open space, decreases, we as designers must become increasingly inventive with compromised or orphaned sites. It's in this context that we're especially grateful to the intentions and the very, very high ambitions of the Veronica Rudge Green Prize. That is to recognize design excellence that contributes, and we should underscore this, to the public realm end of the city and improves the overall quality of urban life. We want to thank the Seattle Art Museum for the vision, courage, and I would underscore persistence they've had in making the Sculpture Park a reality. For us, it's been an extraordinary privilege to give measure to this immeasurable dream and I think maybe to 
Rudolfo's questions about what makes this park uh, unique, I would say that I think great work always starts with an immeasurable dream. So it has been indeed a privilege. In our experience with projects around the country, this project presented an unprecedented opportunity. The museum had defined the aspirations to create a sculpture park like no other, a sculpture park at the intersection of the city and sound. And the question asked of this project is fundamental, how to define a new model for bringing art to the public and the public to the park. We thought we'd share with you some of our, uh, our thinking, our preoccupations, and some of the things that were going on through our mind when we heard this competition announced. Our own preoccupations seem to have strayed rather broadly from the boundaries of what we know of as this, the discipline of architecture. And it's been greatly inspired by the integration of landscape, architecture, infrastructure, and these disciplines have been central to our work and how we design. We have been, I would say, uninterested in the customary distinctions between art and nature or design and ecology, but believe, believe that art and nature are bound together in reciprocity. And so we thought we'd share some images that have been part of our preoccupations that preceded even our involvement in considering the work for this park. This first image is a very haunting one. It's a prehistoric half mile long inscription in Peru and it's believed to, uh, it's believed to represent some kind of an astronomical clock or an a kind of ancient infrastructure, if you will, a marking on the land that's not so much purposeful but profound. And of course, I think all of us have been inspired by the idea of Smithson's iconic work, Spiral Jetty, which seems to comment on the ideas of entropy, but for us is also spatially precise as well as hauntingly temporal. But we start to think about pretty interesting things with topography, and the idea of cultivation and culture are, are two things that one thinks about, and here when we look at Yunnan, China, and we look at the leveling of the land here, the terraces for growing rice or capturing water, we see this topography in such a different way than if it had not been cultivated. And we'd like to take credit for this as one of our works. It is not. Um, but if you think about the Spanish Steps by Despecchi, it really is a kind of public infrastructure, but it's an icon of movement and, an, and a place of choreography and public assembly. And so these are the kinds of things that we'd been thinking about when the park had been announced as a competition. But it had one magical ingredient that none of these images had, which it had infrastructure. And we realized we love infrastructure, but the problem with infrastructure is that it generally seems to obviate the idea of a public realm. But it also invited the question of what could art mean, and art tends to invert our pre preconceived notions about what one thing is or what it is not. And if we look at Flavin's work here with light, we tend to think of light as ephemeral, but here it's hard and profoundly uh, solid. And if we look at Michelangelo's uh, Ecstasy of St. Teresa, we think of stone normally as hard and solid, but here it's liquid and soft. So then we think about Seattle, which is all these strange juxtapositions. It's an amazing city. It's on the water, we think about nature, we think about culture, we think about urban life. And when we think about its water's edge here, the red dot marking the site, we think about an intersection of city, water, port, and land. And then as you come closer, you start to think, what was the Seattle Art Museum thinking? It's three separate sites divided by a high-bodied, wide-bodily, federally mandated trucking route in the middle, and on the other side, it's, a, it's Burlington Northern Trains and Amtrak. And it's a contaminated site owned by, previously owned by Union Oil of California. So we thought, they're really on to something. What was amazing, though, is that this site had extraordinary views. And if you think about the kind of radius of Elliott Bay and then the mountains, the Olympic Mountains beyond, the scale of the site was not the limit of the nine acres, but something profoundly larger. We started to think about sculpture parks. What are they? What are the precedents? Of course, we whipped out all of our homework to figure out what we might want to reproduce or at least not reproduce. But what we found was that most sculpture parks are indeed things that you go to because you know about art. 
The largest one on the bottom, over 500 acres, is Storm King. You get in your car, you make your pilgrimage, you spend the day, but it's for those who know that art is there. Or if you look at the upper left, just to the right of our image of the sculpture park, you'll see a very tiny 0.5 acre one. That's the sculpture park inside the walls of the uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York. And there you paid your price, you've walked in, and only then can you enjoy the special art that retreats from the city. There were other examples that we looked at, but we realized, though, usually you had to know about art before you might find it. And so what was so amazingly generous on the part of the Seattle Art Museum was to say, we want to bring the art to the public and the public to the park, and we're going to rescue this from future condominiums, which were slated, of course, for these two upland parcels, and give something to the public that they could never imagine. Now, again, we should say something about this site. It's extraordinary. There's the four-lane four arterial road in the middle, and then the public parcel, though, on the waterfront, the two upland parcels owned by the museum, the lower parcel, though, is owned by the city. So the thought of the public and private adventure together was really uh, very exciting. You'll see a big white box on the waterfront that was a trolley barn, and for some time there was some question about whether we might find a creative way to include it in the project. We did not. But what was amazing in the previous view was that this is a park in the city, but if you turn around in the other direction, this is profoundly amazing open view or vista of Elliott Bay and the mountains beyond made you realize that this is a place of extremely different vistas, even though it's in one location. It's also a place with an extremely non-politically correct, environmentally wrong-headed history. Uh, this is the Denny Regrade, and what it was was a very profound bluff where the water's edge was actually where that arterial roadway was. And then, brilliant developer that he was, he said, if I can flatten out this bluff and fill the water's edge, I can get a lot more real estate to develop. So this was all hydrological power, but if you notice this strange moon-like uh, landscape on the right, those top peaks were the people who refused to sell at the outset of the Denny Regrade. <laughs> but again, when you think about what the museum had in front of them, it was a place where they're going to create a park that would meet the water's edge, but they could have, what, greened up two parcels and connected to an existing Myrtle Edwards Park, the green that trails the water, and maybe connect it with a couple of bridges, but then they would have had a park with three parcels, two bridges. So we did an amazing amount of research, and always with the hope we'd discover something, but generally looked at the, the seismic history, the geologic history, Seattle's own cultural history, the history of art and landscape, and started to see how these threads might overlap as opposed to be separate. And then we built some models. Um, these are about eight of maybe 60 really, really bad models. But in each case, we were trying to understand what are the forces that might start to impact the configuration or vision for this park. The obvious thing, and I think there are examples like Millennium Park, is to conceal the infrastructure. There's nothing public about the infrastructure, and if it were completely covered over, you'd have one continuous park. But our feeling was that that would be a huge oversight because the energy of the roadways, the energy of the train, the energy of the city was what was unique and special about it. And so we started to cut those lines, those north-south gashes through the plain and then envisioned it literally unfolding with the most urban edge, if you will, being a pavilion for art and exhibition in the public and then wandering down so that it could hook in and almost embed itself into the water. Now, all of that's easier said than done. There were all these forces. There was a desire to create aquatic habitat at one end of the city and then at the other connect to the icon of the needle at the other end and make this a bridge between. There were the roadways, the train lines. There was a contaminated earth that needed to be contained. But all of these things then started to lead to the idea of how could we very simply create a park that might wander from the city to the water's edge and through this slow Z shape, add one more level of infrastructure, but a slow infrastructure that could mitigate the 40-foot grade change between the top of the site and the bottom, crossing the highway, crossing the train tracks. But each angle of the diagonal would then make you appreciate just one view instead of all of the views all at once. Now, early in our thinking, uh, and maybe because the museum didn't have a collection, uh, it was actually a kind of liberating proposition because it allowed us and, and I think the museum in very fundamental ways to rethink art 
uh, beyond the kind of conventions of of what you might expect in a typical sculpture park. So we sort of pose the, the, the kind of question or series of questions. Um, how might we sort of imagine art um, in uh, a multiple set of settings or different conditions? How might program start to uh, interact with art? How might, in fact, vegetation be not only a sort of passive receptacle for art, but how might it actually become a part of the, uh, the sort of making of art? There were paths for art, paths, uh, primary routes, off routes, and then, of course, the meandering route for the anarchists that might sort of uh, want to uh, uh, circumvent the, uh, the architect's tyranny. Um, but it's also a, a fundamentally an urban uh, project. Um, so the thought is that how might the sort of edges of this uh, project melt away so that you didn't quite know when the project stopped and when it started. It's a project on the water, and we'd like to think that there's a, a sort of series of pieces that have yet to um, materialize uh, pieces of art that find their way out into the water. Um, and finally, the great challenge is, is how to bring these uh, elements together in a, in a kind of way in which there's a certain cohesion, an effortless cohesion. Um, if those were the sort of stratas of art, the stratas of the project, these are the political and economic uh, stratas that um, we documented. Fortunately, I think for us and maybe the museum at the end of the project, uh, I think had all of us looked at what it would take uh, early on, we would have been uh, daunted and we cer certainly would have uh, preferred just simply doing a small house. Um, but um, there's something uh, about the kind of choreography of this, uh, the, the planning and the thousands of people, the thousands of, of hours, um, months, years that go into a process like this. And again, we can't, I think, overemphasize the fact that it starts with a question, a question that's either posed by an institution, posed by uh, a political structure, uh, or posed by the public. But without that question, um, there can be no, no end result. It sounds self-evident, but increasingly we're finding that it's so. Um, and out of that, um, those early gestures um, came what appears now, hopefully, to be effortless and without a sort of uh, a level of angst. Um, uh, again, seeing this uh, now um, as we sort of finish, whoops, as we finish up, um, it's actually uh, incredibly daunting. We talked about this project being in the city and, and being multi-layered, and this little concept model, I think, in some ways uh, illustrates the kinds of forces, the way in which uh, we had hoped, and I think the museum had hoped, that these different layers of movement, whether they were water taxis, future uh, um, water taxis, uh, waterfront streetcar, the Alaskan right-of-way, uh, jogging trails on the Myrtle Edwards Park. In a way, the opportunity was to kind of think of these multiple and very, very different speeds of movement as having a kind of aesthetic quality as being woven into and part of the kind of fabric of the design. And you should start to see how the, the kind of bleeding out occurs between the sort of urban edge and Myrtle Edwards uh, Park, which is at the lower edge of, the, of uh, that image. Finally, it's about thinking of, uh, as we design this, how to sort of make this topography wander from a kind of urban condition, the condition of over, perhaps, or into a more sheltered uh, condition, a, a condition of, of kind of enclosure where the view wasn't prominent, uh, where you could get away from the kind of tyranny of this incredibly beautiful view. Um, and then finally, uh, an opportunity to touch the water, which had been absent in the urban condition in Seattle and absent certainly in so many other projects. Um, it's a multi-layered uh, effort, and I think uh, rather than try to sort of go through this in great detail, um, the infrastructural possibilities which are, are indicated in the lower right are identified here, and you can start to see the sort of different modes of movement. There's also the movement of water across the site and the hope that water can be captured and harnessed as a sort of an aesthetic uh, effort. Um, there are multiple paths. And particularly interesting was the opportunity. In many ways, it was sort of a, a, a kind of work in progress. The idea that by reclaiming the topography, we could also um, provoke a new way of thinking uh, in terms of the kind of remediation, which so often um, uh, 
despite all the good intentions, is uh, sort of aesthetically challenged. So how could we think of remediation uh, and try to draw out or sort of squeeze out an aesthetic for the idea of remediation? And then finally, the idea of making a series of precincts that would change, that would become settings first and foremost for art. Um, we've quickly learned, I think, to appreciate the, the, the talents of the many engineers, many consultants we've worked with. And um, we've also, I think, learned to appreciate the kind of uh, the rigor with which earth, that kind of humble material, uh, can be pushed around and turned into something that has spatial consequence, has material quality. And we show this uh, kind of grading plan, this contouring plan, as a way to, to talk about the, not only the sort of simplicity of the gesture, but the way in which the topography can support that gesture. And here you see that, that kind of given measure in a series of cross sections. Um, and uh, originally this drawing actually was done for rather simple purposes, which was to calibrate the amount of fill required on the site. And yet it suddenly becomes a way of gauging and shaping the aesthetic. Um, and likewise, we had talked earlier with Professor Busquets about the kind of material condition of urban projects. And in the end, how can we start to make them um, uh, real? How, what's, the, what's the materiality of this, just as a sculptor might think of uh, working with a very particular material? And here, the kind of transition, the ways in which the topography uh, is measured can be described in, in a way as a mode of construction that's somewhat architectural at the pavilion, then becomes infrastructural bridge over Elliott Avenue or over the BNSF train tracks, and then finally starts to descend and becomes aqueous. Um, and one of the things that was extraordinary about this project was the opportunity to work with not one, but two uh, salmon uh, specialists to uh, develop a, a kind of topography, a sub-water garden that uh, changes as the tides uh, change. And then finally, you can start to see how the process of construction, the kind of choreography of, of construction is evident. And I, I think there's something quite extraordinary and magical about um, the contractors we work with and the ability to uh, sort of mobilize. In a way, it becomes a performance, a, a piece of art in and of itself. Um, and to that sense, uh, this whole construction process um, becomes a, a kind of extraordinary piece of performance art. And you can start to see how uh, that kind of performance, the sort of scale of moving some uh, 200,000 uh, cubic yards of soil uh, over uh, an eight and a half, nine acre site uh, starts to uh, uh, manifest itself. One of the great serendipities of the project was that as the Seattle Art Museum was building their downtown expansion, which occurs uh, a number of blocks to the south, that soil, which otherwise would have uh, either been sold or transported at great cost off-site, um, was transported and used to, in a way, build up the topography. So uh, I think, again, that points out the, the sort of relevance and the importance of the accidental, the, the, ser the serendipitous. Um, and here you start to see the kind of uh, the, the way in which that topography, which uh, in a way is, is there's nothing uh, natural about it. It's artificial, was constructed. It's highly engineered. We think of dirt as a simple material, yet it has a, a very, very high level of, of uh, precision to it. This very hard drawing to read is the system with which the uh, soil is held back and shaped. It's called MSC, uh, which is mechanically stabilized uh, earth. And um, again, the kind of choreography is we find increasingly uh, interesting to sort of play up what might appear to be very humble techniques, but in fact are extremely, uh, uh, very highly engineered and quite sophisticated. Rubble is laid in sequential layers. It's tested for compaction and then held back. And in this case, uh, protected by a series of precast concrete panels. I think there may be a couple hundred precast panels. Each uh, panel is slightly different. And because Seattle has a, oh, how should we say it, a, a uh, active seismic uh, uh, condition, um, it was important that uh, these uh, retaining walls shift and move. And in fact, all retaining walls shift and move. So the sense is to uh, play with that reality and allow the meter of these slip panels to uh, register not only the height, but the uh, ability to capture light 
um, to play with different times of day. The quality of, of Seattle light is, is remarkable in its uh, kind of quicksilver-like change. So we'll start to, I think, maybe walk you through the project a little bit um, in the sense that this first image shows um, Elliot, which is, as Marion described, was the sort of wide-bodied uh, trucking route that in a way separates the site uh, two of the three uh, parcels, a very, very wide, heavily used uh, corridor that goes all the way down into the port of Seattle. Um, and as part of this sort of Z, this wandering path, we had always imagined that uh, this might be not just a bridge, but a kind of continuation of the ground plane, a sort of anti-bridge. The bridge is played down. Um, and you can start to see that uh, in the course of construction, the kind of heroics of spanning this road became something quite, quite beautiful and important to reveal. Um, so the lighting, in a way, takes the meter of uh, the very beautiful steel structure. Rather than conceal it, we try to sort of uplight it and let that meter become evident. Um, it's a setting where uh, you can start to see the calder in a very different way. Often you'll see the calder, the icon of the park, from above. Here you see it from below. We joke with the museum that if somehow a, a, a tripwire were installed, they could uh, count maybe, I don't know, 1,000 visitors a day, 10,000 a month. Um, it's a great marketing opportunity, but we'll, uh, we'll let that one go. Well, if the previous image was all about the kind of drama and the dynamic of the uh, Elliott Avenue road tearing through, what's important is that on the opposite side is the idea of slowness. And so on the very, very top of that intersection, we are literally over, spanning over the, uh, the roadway. This V moment marks the center just to let you have a clue that you are in passage, but the sense is a place of connection as opposed to separation. But Nine Acres is a very, very small park, and so we employed a few artistic devices, if you will, to make it feel larger. From this point, the paths taper and narrow on both left route and right route, and so does the building itself. It begins high at 20 feet and descends down to 8 feet. All of this was a, a trick, if you will, to give the trompe of distance so the park feels, we think, more like 20 acres at this particular vantage site. Um, to the right, though, to the left, the city, to the right on that leg, on a clear day and not in this photograph, Mount Rainier is dead on axis. We'd like to say that we planned that, but it was just a lovely coincidence. Um, but again, these radically different views are focused right here. But then this question of what another crossing might be, as, as much as this one was about providing the greatest continuity of the park, crossing over the train tracks we knew was a more dramatic and exciting moment, so that bridge is slenderer so that the vistas on either side are more profoundly engaged with the train. Because the train itself was something that excited us, and we discovered that there is an enormous train spotting community in Seattle, and it excited them too. But... 110 linear feet is a long span to make, and as we discovered, a very expensive span to make. And so to make this effectively less expensive, one of the moves that occurs here is what's called a thrust block. And this thrust block covers about 18 feet of that span, so we're able to keep the width instead of narrowing it down. But this drama is something that we love uh, so much that we actually accelerated that path as it reached out and created this overlook, an extension of the path that just skips out some 29 feet in the air. Trains go by. And we'll talk a little further about the infrastructural artworks that were incorporated, but you could see the Teresita Fernandez throw bridge, which I'll talk about a moment later. But What's amazing is that the waterfront parcel then was the slenderest, the most contested, the one that had the greatest demands on it and the most public and, of course, the least real estate. We needed to have at least a 12-foot walk. We needed at least a 10-foot bike path. And in Seattle, there's not one but two paid officials who are experts in the bike routes around the city. So you can imagine that all the constituencies needed to be addressed, but also they needed to be placed to meander and in this case, ascend nearly 30 feet to get across the way. What you'll see, though, on the left was that this was what was called an unstable seawall. And there was a moment where it appeared that this particular parcel would not have been included in the project because they had about a $60 million job, they thought, to stabilize the seawall. Um, the museum decided that they would consult their own engineers and found that they were able to, I think, for less than two and a half or five million dollars, stabilize that and simultaneously create salmon habitat. It's creating a new model, I think, for the rest of the city. 
But what this waterfront uh, parcel was was still a magical place even when we first found it. Incredible views, a place where you're finally at, at a grade that's level, but not exactly publicly inviting. And this is what it is now, a place where the grades actually descend and finally reach the water's edge. And in fact, the water that's been collected through the site channels through this little V that you can see between the pedestrian walk and the bike path. And then you can also see that the berms that themselves actually sloped or otherwise are at the conclusion of that Z path before it links to Myrtle Edwards. Now, the rare thing that we had an opportunity to do, and I would say the museum needs to be given a great deal of credit, was to create the first beach in the city where you could actually put your toe in the water right in the city. That meant giving up about two-thirds of an acre of real estate, but in so doing, soften the seawall, push uh, this back, and this is where we did work with two aquatic uh, scientists and a, an engineer who really understood the wind wave action and all kinds of terms that we've learned of highest of high, lowest of low, um, the fetch being the windborne current, and all the things that try to destroy a beach. But what's remarkable here is that we had wanted, and in our original competition image, we had a whole host of driftwood logs coming in, and we understood they were going to come at great cost, so only a few were installed. There was a major storm right before the park opened, and we got all of these for free. But what's amazing is that it truly is a place of quiet and a place of retreat, and especially early in the morning, this beach really is extraordinary. But it's the subsurface that's quite intriguing here. And in fact, just below this level is what's called a bench, and that bench is a, a kind of a strata that runs about six feet below the water, and or sometimes a foot depending on the tide, and it is filled with something called fish mix. And fish mix allows the, the juvenile salmon to thrive. Apparently juvenile salmon are not unlike their human counterparts. They travel in groups. They're very picky about what they eat in their environments. But this allowed a kind of a dynamic life. But more than that, the kelps and the seaweeds that grow here are extraordinary. So when we think about, on one hand, the aquatic scientist, the next question you ask is, what about the art? And the art was remarkable here because it began with one icon, Calder's Eagle, but not a collection where we, like a chessboard, had to arrange or a miniature golf course, arrange the pieces in nice select ways, but it was something that evolved over the course of the project. This gives you a, a vista of a, of a collection of the pieces, but I'll talk about a few. When we first started working on the project, the only work of art was the eagle, and so it showed up in every one of our drawings. And in fact, in the office, it moved all over the model, and we had a team of curators in the office whenever anybody worked on it. But the thought of this piece against the horizon was strong. And indeed, it is strong. And this is a view of it looking out to the Olympic Mountains. And it has become, I think, a meeting place in the city. Even from, from the outset, it was a meeting place when it was kept temporarily in Volunteer Park up the hill. And now it is down here on the horizon. But it's been joined by a family of other pieces. And this is, I would say, uh, anybody under 30 may not know what this is. <laughs> But this is uh, Oldenburg's eraser, and the, uh, the, the actual sighting of this was not ours, but we think it's brilliant. We've never seen an eraser look like it's racing so fast to get away from the other artwork. But if you get down to the water's edge here, this is a place of intense engagement. And you can see on the left, this fountain is Louise Bourgeois's father and son. And it's now more or less concealed uh, the father, which is on the left, but revealed the son and the... Uh, water level goes up and down on this fountain so that they are never completely within eyesight of each other, and it's an amazing piece, and it certainly holds the plaza. And on the right, if you look up towards the train bridge, I mentioned the Teresita Fernandez infrastructural work here. We created a framework, and she created an artwork of the very pragmatic notion of what the uh, Burlington Northern train required, which is a throw fence, not just a vertical fence, but a horizontal one to prevent things from falling on the track. And she created this incredible piece called Seattle Cloud Cover with laminated colored glass to all of a sudden transform an idea of what the skyline might actually be. We like very much the kind of rhythm of uh, those pieces as they change light uh, and reflections and seeing through, through them through the rest of the city. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, an even more 
uh, insane notion of an infrastructural project is Mark Dion's uh, Seattle Vivarium, which is a 60-foot-long rotting log that has been brought to one of the most urban intersections in the city. And it's a nurse log that becomes a host for at least 1,200 different species, which makes us think about nature in a way that is unbelievably profound by its separation from its environment. The green roof above was his idea of not just, you know, creating green to think of the forest, but it actually duplicates the sunlight filter through the forest. And you'll see that there's all kinds of uh, mechanical systems here to simulate what it might be for this rotting log. So I think the Seattle Art Museum can count on about 70 years out of this piece, and then maybe they'll have to replace it with another rotting log. But in fact, what was interesting for us is this idea of intense urbanity and nature being brought together. And this particular piece literally is an urban intersection and a corner. And it flares up to the city, descends down to the grade. And it looks up towards our, or you're seeing up the hill, it looks up to the idea of another structure. And just so that you get a sense of what the pavilion is about, it's really intended to be a place that's open to the park, but also one that is inspired as an unfolding section. It's literally the plan of the park that's compressed tip vertically to allow that unfolding to occur in section. So you can see the vivarium on one end and the building in the other, mediating all these topographies that allowed us actually to allow parking below and an arrival through a crossing moat above. You'll see this kind of strange meter of uh, roughly 30 feet on center bollard lights along the path. We thought it was important not to have a high level of light, but an extremely low level of light at night. There has been, I think, some questions from the aviation department about this particular configuration, but uh, it, it is really quite uh, quiet and soft. Likewise, a, a, another piece, and I think most of you will recognize the sculptor, uh, uh, Richard Serra's um, uh, wake, um, which um, in a way sort of takes the most sheltered corner of the park, the park where you actually get away from the view, get away from the tyranny of the view, and um, kind of in a way uh, shapes that space. And one of the things that we are particularly grateful uh, for in this project, and I think um, there is um, uh, a very real issue, I think, when a private institution hires artists. It's a very different proposition because often the artists are provocative. They may not um, please a large segment of the public, but in large measure, the quality will be extraordinarily high. And Richard's work has often been criticized for being uh, inhuman and uh, uh, difficult, uh, but it's, this is an incredibly lyrical piece, and it was actually a privilege to work with someone whose sense of space, whose dimensional precision was so finely tuned. Um, in fact, in, uh, again, it's serendipitous that uh, this collection was not in place, but um, when uh, the uh, sort of the design work was being done to cite this particular piece, it was Richard's idea, actually, to calibrate the, uh, the valley, the sort of lower level, with a series of concrete retaining walls to sort of develop a, a, a sense of tension between his piece and the enclosure. And I think that kind of dialogue, that kind of conversation um, would not have happened uh, under other circumstances or with other artists. Um, the assembly of this heroic piece is, is uh, 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 a performance art uh, of the highest order in and of itself. Uh, we wish we could have kind of frozen this particular moment in time, and I'm sure, um, uh, well, the folks who lived in those condos might not have felt that way, but um, it's just a, a incredible to see these huge pieces um, trucked in. And then uh, here's Richard Serra standing very proudly, the proud father, uh, next to his piece. Um, again, the sort of fabrication, the installation, the making of this park, the making of any kind of urban uh, park is, uh, in a way, uh, a work of art in and of itself. But here you see the piece. Um, think of it uh, by night. Um, here uh, it kind of disappears a little bit and becomes this incredible sort of foil to the lit pavilion, um, which in many ways is a sort of a bit of a Kunsthalle. It, it, it doesn't have a kind of collection. It will have uh, pieces that will change over time. It's a place where... Uh, you can have events, uh, both events for pleasure, events uh, that are intellectually driven. Uh, it's really a public room, a kind of indoor, indoor public room. Um, 
And the, the, the sort of uh, hope was that the pavilion would somehow sort of melt into the landscape or you would see the landscape melt uh, up into the pavilion. So here you can start to see the sort of steps of the pavilion um, uh, accommodating all sorts of unprogrammed events. Uh, with time, there'll be uh, programmed events, dances, uh, choreographed uh, events, lectures, movies. Uh, this place is, uh, this particular setting is wired so that uh, there can be a, a film festival. Um, in this case, uh, some of the art pieces are totally temporary. This is Eole Alessandrini's very beautiful laser piece, which turns grass into these kind of brittle, uh, um, incredible, uh, almost uh, radiant uh, crystals and completely reformulates how we see the ground plane. Likewise, inside the pavilion, the idea of the section, um, the kind of unfolding, the hope is that 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 section continues on up. There's a place up here to look over and take in the whole view so that there isn't a kind of distinction between inside and outside, between the pavilion as an artifact and the ground plane within it, with, upon which it sits, but rather those, those two are in conversation with each other. This is a very beautiful piece by Pedro Reyes, a young uh, Mexican artist. Uh, I think this was one of his largest pieces. The other uh, component to his piece is a series of pupelas, which invite uh, children and adults uh, to kind of crawl in and see space differently. They move. There's something quite uh, wonderful and, um, and, and sort of light uh, in their appropriation of, of what otherwise is a, a very tough, tough space. So that kind of commentary, that sort of friction uh, that artists can sometimes uh, act uh, upon, become agents provocateurs, is something that was completely uh, a surprise. Um, you can start to see as you step back, the kind of pavilion has uh, deep overhangs. Um, Seattle, um, we think of it as rainy, but it actually uh, can be very, very warm. And during the summer, uh, the light is just brilliant and uh, there's need for shade. So the hope is that uh, something as simple as providing a, a shaded place to uh, have a drink, have a coffee, take in the view would be something uh, important. Whoops. Um, Again, there are things that happen that we couldn't have anticipated, the sort of collapse of space, the sense of watching people move, and in a way, watching the human body meter what is otherwise a fairly significant uh, change in topography. We have been increasingly uh, interested in, in uh, materials that have sort of multiple lives, and um, it was our hope that the, the pavilion, which is made of uh, custom fritted glass, thin bands of mirrored frit, and uh, kind of carefully pleated stainless steel would play with the changing quality of light. Um, Seattle has this um, amazing, uh, Seattle light is amazing in that it, it changes. Uh, the weather, you can have five or six weather patterns over the course of the day. And uh, in effect, it was our hope that we'd be able to invite the temporal, the accidental, the unpredictable uh, to be a kind of active participant in the design of the park and in the shaping and the reading, the kind of uh, the sensations that you would get uh, in, the in the material quality of the pavilion. So you can start to see early explorations of how to how to capture that light. Um, at times, uh, that light makes the stainless steel appear almost jet black. At other times, it's a sort of dull, almost zinc like gray. Here you see the kind of frame view, the calder. Uh, and we're walking actually on the sidewalk, so the hope is that even someone not interested in art might rethink how uh, they see art. Um, at times, the fritted glass is, is extremely translucent uh, and uh, diaphanous. The pleated stainless uh, steel catches the sort of almost arbitrary and accidental uh, array of lights uh, that flicker across as cars become, and these lights become participants in the skin. Um, and here you start to see the sort of the, the way in which the city um, is the experience of urbanity, I suppose, is is intensified and uh, um, brought into the design. But in the end, it's it's also about bringing the city to uh, to this incredible view with the Olympic Mountains, where they're sort of almost ghost like on the horizon, trying to give that sort of otherwise difficult to define view, some kind of measure, some way of framing. Um, and likewise, it's about pushing that horizon 
back into the city and letting it sort of seep into uh, urban life. And so ultimately, right before it opened, and this photograph was a week before it opened, we realized that it, it seemed like it had made itself literally a, a completely artificial piece of nature or a completely relaxed piece of the city. But it really was, in our own mind, the biggest priority to create a park that might wander from the city to the water's edge but become an icon. And when one thinks about the horizontal terrain, we think of icons and towers, but how might a park become an icon uh, was another question for us. We also were worried that nobody would show up for the opening day. And this was uh, a treat because, again, opening day was in January. I think I should put that in context. And January is not always as forgiving. Um, but what was remarkable, though, is that the sense of being able to stroll and wander, the idea of promenade really seemed to take, take heart in the opening days, and I think it still continues to. And so what we thought would be important to share is 60 seconds of movement of what it means for this park to be in motion. And I'll close with a few words after our, our very short film. In conclusion, I think Michael and I have to say that this has been an extraordinary adventure and an extraordinary honor and privilege to work with infrastructure in motion. <laughs> um, but we feel incredibly grateful to receive this award because it's a recognition, I think, as much as anything, of the huge uh, vision that the park, that the museum had to create this park in the middle of the city. And it's our hope that the Olympic Sculpture Park reconnects the fractured relationships between art, ecology, and urban life, and that the design remains deliberately open-ended, inviting new interpretations of art, environmental engagement, and hopefully simple pleasure. Thank you. After the, the presentation by Mario and uh, Michael, I think you, you can understand that we were very convinced that the jury unanimously agreed to give the prize to this remarkable project. I want just to add into that, because I think that was a, a conclusion that we came across, is the, the great responsibility of that project into the city of Seattle. We can see in that image how important this not into the city makes a new reinterpretation of this gridded town where the infrastructure were cutting the city with the water. Is that the way this idea makes us feel also the, uh, the possibility that that project is also a sort of pioneer project, perhaps for the city of Seattle, but also for other waterfront cities, in a way that is a project that allows the possibility of jumping the city to the water, but also to rescale the infrastructure without denying the power of the infrastructure in the city and to create the ideas that the new urban space, new, new program. That's the way. Those are the, the things that our jury was very much strong in the decision of that project among 
as Professor Machado said before, 80 projects coming from 30 different countries around the world. And that's the reason that I like very much uh, to ask you to join me in awarding the ninth Veronica Ruth Green Prize given by the Graduate School of Design to Marion Weiss and Michael Manfredi for the project Olympic Sculpture Park for the Seattle Art Museum.